Good afternoon. Thank you, you all for being here today. A special thank to the European Central Bank and to the Bank of Portugal for organizing the first European Central Bank Year's Dialogue. I would like to welcome Professor Mario Draghi, the President of the European Central Bank, and Dr. Carlos Costa, the Governor of the Bank of Portugal, to the, our School of Economics and Management of the University of Lisbon. The University of Lisbon is the largest university in Portugal. We have about 50,000 students, uh, 3,000 faculty members, and 3,000 members of the staff. We work with a, a budget of 400 million euros, half of them coming from a competitive budget. We are doing very well. We are a research university, as you can see when you look to the Shanghai ranking that we see that uh, we rank better than any Latin South Europe university except France. Uh, so we are very honored to have you here today to host this event in our School of Business and Economics and to provide an opportunity for the Portuguese students in economics and management to ask questions and discuss with a voice with Professor Draghi the role of the European Central Bank and some of the most relevant economic topics in today's world. Dr. Draghi, Professor Draghi, thank you very much for sharing with us your knowledge and experience. Thank you. Many, Many thanks, Professor Antonio Cruz Serra, for your welcoming remarks. Uh, my name is Christine Greff. I run the communications of the ECB, and I will be moderating through this Q&A session today. Um, before we start, I would just like to remind you that we're going to do a live webcast on the ECB webpage. And for those of you who are listening and who are watching us, us live, you can follow the conversation using the hashtag ECB Youth Dialogue on Twitter. Um, and without too much ado, let me introduce to you the president of the European Central Bank, Mr. Mario Draghi. Thank you. in the Universidades de Lisboa, in this beautiful library with 80 students from different universities in Lisbon. And we've also asked youth to submit their questions via social media, which is a first for us, so they can participate virtually. And I really wanted to start with asking you, why is the ECB doing this youth dialogue? Why is it so important? Well, many thanks, many thanks. Let me first uh, also thank the Rector, Antonio Cruz Serra, and ISEG for hosting this first ECB Youth Dialogue. And of course, to my friend, Governor Carlos da Silva Costa from Banco de Portugal for this close collaboration in the organization of this event. But especially, I want to thank you, students, who I know how pressed you are, because this is exams time. So the fact that you've taken time here to be is really, really something I'm very thankful. I hope I'm not going to disappoint you. Uh, before we start, however, I wish to say something about uh, the um, tragedy that this country experienced not long ago and not far from here. Just want to express not only solidarity with the families of the people who lost their lives, but also to express how, how close we all are, both my colleagues at ECB and myself, and um, for this, I just just a few seconds of silence before we actually get into, into our work. Thank you. Thank you. Let me now respond to Christine's question, why uh, we organized this event. And let me give you two, at least two key reasons. First, we have a, we have a theme this year for this event, which is um, somewhat different from what the central bank usually do. And it's about uh, innovation and productivity. These are topics that are very important for the economic future of Europe, but I think even more fundamentally for your own future. 
The youth, uh, as you know, the youth unemployment rate is very high here, but also in other, several other countries in, uh, in, uh, in the Eurozone. Uh, in some countries, it's close to 50%. Here, it's 28%. Uh, it's declining, but it's still very high. Now, youth unemployment rates are normally higher than total unemployment rates, but there are big differences across countries. And this says basically one thing, that the sum of these differences can be accounted by the way labor markets function, and they function differently in different countries. So how all this is linked to innovation and productivity? This is, in fact, the core of the conversation we will hold in the ECB forum in Sintra during the next two days. We can achieve growth with low levels of employment. Can we? This is one big key question. The key to productivity growth lies not just in the creation of new ideas, but also, and I would argue, especially in its diffusion, in the diffusion of these new ideas, in the way in which we integrate those ideas in our daily lives. Innovation is playing a critical role in the global economy and in the EU economy more than ever. So you are a generation which naturally grew up in a world where new ideas were continuously developed, in a way that people, not only of my generation, but also a generation after mine, had no, no, no idea that this could be possible. So you are much more acquainted with innovation and new technologies than probably anybody before you. At the same time, you are the generation who also grew up as the, as the first truly European generation. And how all this affect, affects you and your region is also part of the discussion we are going to have. So you are prepared and enhance your skills to success in the ever-changing labor market in Europe and around the planet. Second, you may know it, this year we celebrate the 60th anniversary of the Treaty of Rome, which created Europe, and the 25th anniversary of the Maastricht Treaty that created the Monetary Union and the Euro. These treaties had a common goal for the future, a strong, prosper, peaceful, and united Europe. And all the European institutions, including the European Central Bank, are working very hard from different perspectives to achieve that vision. I think you've heard a lot about monetary union, monetary policy in ECB. You study our work in our institution in your university. You hear about us in the media, even in conversation with friends. Well, I hope you have better things to talk about with your friends, but in any event, you may actually discuss ECB sometimes with your friends and even with your families. And um, now we want to do something that different from uh, we, what we usually do. Usually we go around and we talk. It's us who talk. Now this time it's us who want to listen, want to listen to you, your points, your observations. That's why I asked you to ask us questions. And you did. We received questions from all over Europe, of course, and from across the world, including China and the United States. And I have already known that many of you have concerns about how innovation will affect your present and future, that you are worried about inequality, that you are also interested in finance technology, the impact of monetary policy decisions, so you talked about dialogues and platforms for you to become more active in social media. That's why we started with this initiative and this platform, to engage with you and try to address some of your concerns. So now I really want to be, uh, keep my word and shut up. I'm listening. Many thanks, President. Thank you. So indeed, we're now going to... So indeed, we're now going to turn to you um, and start with questions. The first question is from our host university, from ISEC. 
And I'm inviting Veronica, and I'm sorry if I misspelled the names, Veronica, Raquel, <coughs> Diaz, Castro, and Silva to ask her first question to President Draghi. Hi, um, thank you so much. Stand up. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Welcome to Lisbon. My question is, uh, should the ECB's uh, quantitative easing program started er have started earlier alongside the one implemented by the Fed? Mm, thank you. Thank you. I mean, this is not, it's not an easy question to answer. And uh, so my, my response will have, to be, uh, will have to be a little longer than uh, I'm, I'm sure you and I would wish to be. But to be complete, I guess, it will have to be a little long. Because there are many differences between, uh, between uh, the Fed and the ECB. They have to do, uh, well, between the US and the Eurozone. It, it, there are structural differences. There are uh, ways in which monetary policy is being carried out by the two institutions. And there are differences in the way the crisis developed in, the, in, in, both, in both parts of the world. Let me start from this point, from this point. At the end of 2007, so almost 10 years, almost 10 years ago, the subprime crisis erupts. And both institutions, the ECB and the Fed, react pretty much in the same way. Namely, with extreme decision, they expanded liquidity in a very forceful way. And they basically hamper the diffusion of the crisis immediately. But we were to discover that that was only the beginning of the crisis. Later on, the whole world moves into a state of great and increasing uncertainty, but for one year, about one year, not really a big crisis. Then in 2009, we have the big uh, bailouts in the United States. And we have the gradual discovery that uh, all these products have intoxicated many banks in Europe. And we reach the point with Lehman, the crisis of Lehman. That is a turning point. That is a turning point. But, and what, but how the, the crisis in, in the United States continues to develop and uh, along the line where the Fed substantially tried to cope with the effects of the crisis upon the economy. The United States is a market-based economy where most financing goes through the markets. The Eurozone is a bank-based economy where most of financing goes through the banks. More specifically, 80% of credit flows go through banks in Eurozone, or in Europe really, and only 30 in the United States. And this is the big, first big difference between the two situations. In the meantime, the Fed brings the interest rates to what's called zero lower bound and then starts QE because there are no more instruments. And the negative effects of the crisis continue propagating in the United States. In, uh, in Europe, in the Eurozone, something different happens. The uncertainty and the increasing uncertainty of previous years faces many governments many countries which were unprepared. They had, uh, they had basically budgets which were very fragile, high levels of debt, very little structural reforms. So the crisis morphs into a sovereign debt crisis. And in 2010 happened something that really changed the whole picture. Because what used to, we were used to a world where sovereign debt was risk-free and all other assets were priced based upon the risk-free asset price. In 2010, this changes, and sovereign debt becomes no, no more risk-free. It's risky, like any other asset. And this changes the whole risk picture, risk pricing picture in the Eurozone. Now, what happened also is that our banks many of our banks in many countries had bought a lot of sovereign debt. And so the sovereign debt crisis morphed into a banking crisis. So in 2010, already in 2010, the ECB decides to start a reduced version of QE, which was called the S&P. 
trying to support the sovereign debt market in a way that could be shielded from these big changes in, in, in interest rates and prices. But the, 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 as I said, the risk, the, the crisis morphs into a banking crisis. And so by, 2000, by the end of 2011, credit flows were going, were dropping, were falling very substantially. So the ECB decides to launch the long-term refinancing operations, otherwise called ELTROs, which meant basically unlimited refinancing at favorable conditions and for unprecedented maturities of four years. Everybody thought this was indeed a big support for the banks and avoiding widespread failures in the banking system. And for a few months, this worked. But then again, the banking crisis, sovereign debt crisis took over. And what was necessary was the OMT, the launching of the OMT. OMT could have been a much, much bigger decision than QE. Fortunately, there was no need, because markets reacted in a way they recognized that something that they were pricing in, namely the fall of the euro, was not going to happen any longer. So overall, the financing conditions improve quite substantially. And something that's rarely mentioned is that between 2000, the end of 2012, the, to, during 2012 and 2013, something like two million jobs are being created. So the recovery had started already, very, very slowly, gradually, but continuously. Now, if we go back to the beginning of 2012, we had something like 16 quarters of uninterrupted growth with an average of 0.4%. But then, once the sovereign crisis, the banking crisis had been kind of slowed down, and by the way, the fragmentation that had taken place in Europe also was decreasing, then in 2014, we, thanks to spillovers from the rest of the world, we enter in a situation where basically there are renewed, crises, renewed risks for the economy and risks of deflation. And that's when the ECB responds very much like the Fed did originally, namely with a QE. So the lesson is basically that <clears throat> both institutions responded with their instruments to different contingencies during crises which were profoundly different in places of the world with big structural differences. And uh, also, one should take into account another thing. The tradition of uh, making monetary policy in the two institutions was different. In the Fed, in a market-based economy, the Fed did monetary policy through open market operations, namely buying government assets and injecting liquidity, or else selling government assets and uh, <clears throat> withdrawing liquidity. In Europe, the main channel, since it's a bank-based economy, was through banks, financing the banks. Well, both institutions actually changed their monetary policy practices during the crisis. The Fed moved much more into refinancing, and the ECB moved much more into government bonds buying policies. We also added another ingredient that the Fed didn't have, which was the negative interest rates, of course. Let's stop here. Sorry, but it had to be long to be complete. So the next question is focusing on productivity and unemployment. It comes from Cyprus, so it's not in the room, but it was sent to us via Facebook. Oh. You have it here on the screen, but let me <coughs> read it for everyone. Dear Mr. Draghi, it is evident that investment in capital-intensive production can improve productivity. However, in countries <coughs> experiencing economic recession and unemployment like Greece, do you consider it best to, invent, to invest in technology, directly boosting productivity, or investing in the labor force, leading to a potential long-run increase in productivity and employment instead? Well, let me first observe. There is no trade-off between investing in productivity and investing in people. Uh, if, we, if, we, if by investing in people we mean investing in education, in skills, in human capital, I would say that the two complement each other. Investing in technology is complemented by investing in human capital. But there's also another aspect that we should, uh, we should always keep in mind when we talk, I hinted at it in my introductory remarks, when we talk about, uh, about productivity and innovation, that um, in, especially in Europe, diffusion of innovation 
it may even be more important than innovation itself. In other words, there is so much space for, diff diff for spreading innovations from the high com highly competitive companies to the ones that are less competitive. In Europe, we have much, much space to do that. How could this happen, however? It can happen only if the environment is growth friendly. What does it mean? Well, it means that it should be open to receive the technology. It means that one should fight for greater competition, for reducing barriers, for fighting against vested interests. This is what it's an open environment, a growth-friendly environment. It means that taxation should be growth-friendly. This is, it means that the companies, the young, small companies, which often are the, fir the first engines for innovation, especially not big innovation, should be able to find credit which means to have a relatively healthy banking system that can provide credit with. So all this is what fosters diffusion on innovation growth. So I see basically no uh, trade-off between investing in, in technology and investing in people, but what's important is to create the environment where these investments produce, in the end, produce growth. Thank you. We've got the third question coming from Nova University and Jose Elisio da Silva Santos. The floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Draghi. Thank you for being here. Uh, my question is, uh, we, how do we, as young economists, managers, bankers, how can we create these dialogue platforms like this one to become more active, more informed citizens? And how can we help other citizens also understand the policy stance? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Let's start from, 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 from a point that is only, uh, that characterize your, your time, certainly didn't characterize mine. You have boundless technology possibilities for uh, strengthening, for enhancing your social capacity. So technology is not really a limit here. And, and it, by the way, and it's progressing each and every time. And very much of this progress is immediately usable. So there are, there are relatively, at least as far as social diffusion, diffusion of social views, there are relatively few impediments. So next question is, uh, next question is, what am I gonna do with this? Uh, it's quite clear that all this is gonna be an energy for good if it produces reliable, and transparent information. That's the pillar of trust. On the other hand, if this doesn't happen, there is no trust. And then it's a big waste, in a sense, because you have big possibilities that are not being used. So your communication should be geared, or should be aiming at producing trust. And trust comes from reliable, and transparent information. To do that, there are various things that, I mean, you, for, certainly for, to strengthen your social interaction, one is to have a keen interest in social aspects. Follow your policymaker's track record. That's also, that's also very, very important. And, and, and generally speaking, is what I said before, aim at producing trust. I think that's, that's the key point today now. The fourth question is, uh, is again, in reality, it's actually two questions. It comes from Finland, and we've selected the second part of it. <coughs> it was sent again via Facebook, and I'll read it out. Mr. Draghi, I would like you to share your thoughts on how inequality affects even financial stability. Thank you for this great initiative. Well, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> Inequality, inequality, well, first of all, there is a, a renewed and welcome interest by everybody in, uh, in, uh, in coping with this issue of inequality. After many, many years, we simply ignore the issue. Uh, the globalization, the greater competition, the um, diffusion of technologies uh, have produced, uh, have produced uh, immense wealth. Uh, but unfortunately, have also have also produced a, a very equally equally large 
crowd of losers, of people who are not caught in the sharing of the benefits. That's, the tip, that's really the main feature in my eyes of inequality, is basically there are people who are not part and parcel of the, ongo the normal ongoing of an economy where they cannot share the benefits, they cannot buy a house, buy a car. In this sense, it's a highly destabilizing phenomenon which touches all parts of our societies, including, including financial stability. Now, how we, we, we asked ourselves this question, what can a central bank, what can the ECB do uh, about inequality? For one thing, uh, and there we, we, is a certain amount of reflection on this and, and, and thinking about that. Well, certainly one thing, if we are successful at, uh, uh, at achieving our mandate, which is price stability, we help to fight against inequality. We have to understand that price stability in this context means to be able to reach a slightly higher rate of inflation. You know about our mandate, a rate of inflation which is close but below 2%, and we are not there. Why is that? Because a slightly higher inflation by itself benefits the debtors. Right now, a too low rate of inflation benefits the creditors. Traditionally, creditors are older people, and, and debtors are younger people. But it's also a much more important way in which the right monetary policy decisions, but I think I should widen this to any right, right economic policy decision, is the best tool against inequality. The major source of inequality is unemployment. So to the extent that our policies, first and foremost, of course, as far as I'm concerned, monetary policy, fight unemployment, they fight inequality. And that's the key angle as far as we are concerned. Of course, there are many other, reasons, many other ways to fight inequality. And certainly, again, I hinted at that in the beginning, education, skills, investment in human capital is also one way. And of course, there are also redistributed policies that we should take into account. But it's not for, the, for a humble I mean, central bank governor to suggest what people should do to redistribute better wealth and income. But certainly, that also should be taken into account. But the key point is what the question was asking at the beginning. Is it a seriously destabilizing factor that we should cope and have in our, in our minds Yes, it is. Moving on uh, to a question from Universidad Católica, and I would like to invite Ms. Dina Rodriguez. Where are you? Over there, to ask your question. Uh, welcome, thank you for the opportunity. I'm going thank to you. read off my phone, sorry. <laughs> so I believe one of the issues that most showers public trust in European institutions is the phenomena of revolving door jobs, public, former public officials quickly taking on jobs in sectors they previously supervised. The recent example of Durand Burroughs moving on to Goldman Sachs just after the cooling off period imposed by the European Commission expired show that on some cases a time, a time lag makes little difference to how an appointment is perceived and more transparency is required by the public. So do you think the ECB's framework adequately, adequately deals with this issue? Thank you. Yes, I think so. The, um, the, um, but let me just uh, address your question which in all its entirety. Institutions, uh, institutions always need trust. A central bank especially needs trust. Uh, much of the monetary policy today uh, is actually always being based on credibility. And credibility is also, also based on trust. Now, trust is, uh, is actually the outcome of many, many different actions, but it, trying to uh, co cope with, uh, with the angle that, uh, that you have. First of all, trust comes from communication. Communication needs to be transparent and accountable. And um, we've done an enormous progress in communication. I mean, just think about, not, not, only, not only the ECB, but all central banks. Just think about that, in, in the, if I'm not mistaken, in the mid-90s, until the mid-90s, 
The US Fed would change interest rates after monetary policy meetings and would not communicate to anybody that they did so. They would have to learn it from the market. Now, uh, in our case, we, we, we already, since the beginning, the ECB was a very transparent central bank with several press conferences after each, po each monetary policy meeting and the economic bulletin, much communication, speech, reviews, hearings. Now, we continue this tradition. We actually enlarged it quite significantly. Today, we, obviously, we have also occasions like this one. Is, uh, the whole, and the, uh, our, our forum in Sintra is going to be webcast, so it's all very transparent. Um, the ECB is accountable only to the European Parliament. Well, in spite of that, I started going also to national parliaments, interacting also with them. And uh, now I'm getting closer to the conflict of interest thing. Uh, since 2015, we, uh, we publish an account of our meetings, of our monetary policy meetings. So again, that is also other material that would give people a sense of what we've been discussing. My personal diaries, and the ones of my colleagues in the board with the meetings we have are also published on a regular basis. Also, we have a framework that deals with conflict of interest, with cooling off periods, rules that prevent basically conflicts of interest, what sort of invitations we accept and we don't accept. I almost accept no invitation, for example. Yours, yes, but others very often, I, very, very often I have to refuse them because they, exactly, they could be seen or perceived as conflicting with this framework, basically, or with what people would expect from, uh, from, a, from a monetary policy maker to behave. So I, I, I do think we, we cope with this sort of okay, I would say. Of course, we can always do better, I'm pretty sure. And we learn from criticisms on occasion, and we try to change our procedures whenever we think that a certain criticism isn't warranted, or is warranted, actually. Thank you. So now we have a question from Germany, which is a question by Twitter focusing on youth and monetary policy. It's quite a provo provocative question, and here it goes. Mr. Draghi, don't you realize that your interest rate policies make it impossible for millennials to build up wealth? Well, first, let's talk. It depends which millennials we talk about. The millennials that have found a job because of our monetary policy, I'm pretty sure they are okay with this policy. So um, I got I, to distinguish between different types of millennials here. Now, there are also millennials who save money, or more likely, they are sons or daughters of, uh, mille of no millennials, of, uh, of people who are true savers. And um, so basically are, are your parents, your grandparents, and so on. And, uh, I've said it many, many times, this. Let's not forget, the savings comes from growth. And if there is no growth, there is no savings. And interest rates have to be low for growth to recover. So when growth will recover and when inflation expectations will show that a convincing trend towards our objective, interest rates will go back to be higher. And at that point, savers will also have their returns. But if we were to raise interest rates at the wrong time, we would simply produce another recession. And recessions aren't good for anybody, savers and non-savers. Also, let me add to, let me make also another consideration. Millennials are probably too young to buy a house. But for those slightly older than millennials, who also have to go and buy a house and they need a mortgage, low rates are very good. They are very, there's something they really cherish. In other words, we got to be patient. The savers of the core countries would like to see a bigger return to their savings. They will see that in due time. In the meantime, we have to make sure that inflation will converge again towards our objective and the economy will recover. So let me turn to the floor to Jao Pinto from ISTE. 
Ciao. Good afternoon, Hi. everyone. Uh, President Draghi, uh, as advanced economies struggle with output below potential, particularly since the global financial crisis, severe challenges are facing the coming decades. Uh, one of the most intensely debated among researchers is productivity growth. Uh, in fact, productivity, which is the ultimate engine for economic growth, has been exhibiting in the recent decades a downward path persistent, which clearly undermines growth pro prospects. Given so, my question will be, what is your view on the origins or the sources uh, of this current global low productivity trap? Is it a cyclical downturn or a long-term phenomenon? Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a, it's a, it's a very difficult question on, uh, on which there, are, there is a variety of views and no, no hard uh, understanding of, uh, of the real reasons. Um, the cyclical downturn in productivity really started uh, well before the crisis, the great crisis. Then, of course, with the crisis, um, investment went down, also investment in everything went down, capacity utilization rates went down, expectations of future investments went down, all this only increased the downturn in productivity. And, um, but there is also, we have to look at the trend. Also, the trend in productivity is not, uh, is not uh, something that we would like to see. Um, now, again, I, I kind of uh, say again what I said before. Much of this is also, as far as especially Europeans are concerned, deals with diffusion of technologies. And that's where, I think, that's the first action that we know for sure it produces increases in productivity, namely create an environment where diffusion of technology is easy. And I went through some indications that how, on how this could be achieved before. So we've now got a question coming from quite far away, via LinkedIn from China and it's relating to one of the topics you mentioned. I'll read it out. What is the impact of fintech to traditional finance industry? Would the ECB put more resources to the high-tech development? Well, we, um, the ECB certainly supports financial innovation, finan fi fintech. fintech. We've uh, started in the last year and a half uh, several streams of work the most recent example is something we decided uh, a week ago to uh, start on, the, on a project called Instant Payment, whereby consumers and firms can transfer money between them instantly, 24 hours a day for 365 days. And, um, and that, that is the last example. Uh, we also... Uh, do support the distributed ledger technology. That's quite another important, very important development, where you basically uh, can store information on a decentralized base. And more generally, we have, uh, we have a sort of great attention to these, these developments for a variety of reasons. First of all, because they uh, improve and to some extent may even strengthen the financial system against cyber attacks. And, and the other reason is, related reason really, is that uh, cyber crime is a major danger for financial stability, and more and more of this will, uh, will have to be, will have to be uh, coped with by, by supervisors in an, in an effective way. There has been the, the last G7 ministers, uh, finance ministers, and central bank governors meeting dealt with this explicitly. There are several task forces that are working actively on this point, on this. This is part and parcel of FinTech, really. So generally speaking, great attention, uh, strong support, also concerns for the efficiency and uh, the safety uh, in the use of these new, new technologies. We're now moving to Tomas de Almeida dos Santos of Nova University. Just 
Professor Draghi, thanks for your presence. Um, okay. A question about the banking system. Um, in the last 10 years, Portugal spent with bailouts more than 10 billion euros to have a sense of scale for the, for the Portuguese economy. This is almost, this is around the total uh, money that uh, Portuguese government collects from in income taxes, personal income taxes. So it's a lot of money. Uh, so my question to you is what ha exactly has been done over the last years to make sure that this will never happen again so that our tax money will not be spent with banks. Thank you. Thank you. Well, think of it. Germany spent about 11% of their GDP in bailouts. So it's also, it's partly in reaction to these um, uh, very big bailouts, very significant bailouts, where taxpayers' money was used to uh, exactly bail out uh, banks' creditors, bank depositors, bank shareholders. It depends which one, uh, which bailout example we are talking about. It's because of, a, it's partly, partly, I would say to a great extent, in reaction to these developments, that uh, the European Union adopted a directive called the Banking Resolution and Recovery Directive, where basically the conditions are, uh, for a bailout are much, much more difficult to comply with. So that whenever we have a major banking episode, a banking crisis, the, uh, there would be first and foremost a bail-in of the shareholders and certain categories of creditors. And then for the rest, if this is not enough, the rest would be coped with by banking resolution funds. Now, this is, uh, now we've, been, we've been having this directive for a few years. Uh, we've, we've, we've had several crises around. Now, the, the, main, the main purpose of the directive is to make sure that, we, that, that basically the use of taxpayer money is, taxpayers' money is, is minimized but also that the bank activity is preserved so that the failure of a bank doesn't involve the destruction of the bank's activity with also the waste of resources that this implies. Then, uh, now it's been a few years that, that this uh, direct has been in place. Uh, can we say that it's actually performed successfully? Well, I think it's, it's really too early to say. It's too early to say we had, uh, we had many episodes that ended up in a way perhaps that the creators of the directive didn't expect, others did. The, so it's just early to say. The resolution, this, the, the, the resolution board is a new institution which is also important for the application of this directive. But one thing is pretty clear, and we, that, that's one lesson that would apply without uncertainty. Banks have to increase their own means, have to increase, have to put aside resources that are capable to absorb losses in case of a crisis. And we had at the international level a measure that's called TILAC, which has been transposed in a, to some extent by and large in a, in, a, in a measure in Europe called M MREL and basically asking banks, in the European case, all banks, in the, in, the, in the rest of the world case, only the largest banks, to set aside resources that are, that are easily mobilizable in case of losses, in case of a crisis. I think that's the best way to make the BRRD, the directive, a credible measure that would end up minimizing taxpayers' money in the case of crisis. And then we had another question from Spain coming via Facebook. Um, Dear Mr. Draghi, I'm a fourth year medical student and I've seen how most of the innovation in the medical field occurs outside of Europe. In your opinion, could developing a more innovative medical sector contribute to the improvement of our economy? Well, um, I'm hardly an expert in that, but um, I, 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 I assume that, um, that uh, this is true, namely that much innovation happens in the United States. I don't know it for sure. Uh, but certainly things have improved uh, in Europe with respect to this. But again, let's us ask uh, what, uh, let's assume there is a problem there. 
how would a policymaker in Europe cope with this problem? Uh, it, not, not from a scientist, not from a scientific viewpoint, but from a, a, a policy viewpoint. Now, one should ask, what are the reasons for this lag in innovation in the medical sector? What is the regulation that oversees innovation in the medical sector? Can we do better of that? What is the diffusion process? How difficult it is to spread around medical innovation in, uh, in Europe? What are the spe ex experimentation rules, which are crucial, in, uh, obviously, in medical innovation? So these are questions that um, I can only ask. I'm certainly not able to answer them. Thank you. So we have one last question from Universidad Católica. So let me invite Ricardo Rodriguez. Where are you? To um, ask your question. Good afternoon. I would like to thank you for well, coming here. Thank you. And now, Mr. Draghi, I would like to ask you, uh, you and basically the ECB, how do you conduct policy in an environment where are different countries at different stages of the recovery process, which individually may require <coughs> different measures or even opposite measures to foster Productivity and innovation. Thank you. Thank you. Now, of course, I, let, me, let me premise saying that uh, we really do only one, uh, we, we don't have different countries. We have only one Eurozone. So our monetary policy is for the whole of the Eurozone. But to, uh, to give you a, um, say, a more, a more substantive answer to your question, um, let me make a comparison with the United States. In the US, you have different states, and they go at different speeds. And um, like, like any other part of the world, you don't have everybody marching at the same rhythm. No? It would be boring, among other things. But, but it, you have, they go at different speeds. Now, different speeds may cause disequilibrium and imbalances. Now, this is being mitigated in the United States by the fact that they, there is a federal budget. So there are transfers across different parts of the US to compensate the possible imbalances that would come from moving forward at different speeds. Our union is not a transfer union. That's what the Maastricht Treaty stated. So we don't have a federal budget. We have other ways to partly mitigate these imbalances that come from different speeds. But that's why, that's why in the Eurozone, convergence, namely the capacity to try to aim at going at the same speed, is fundamental. Is fundamental. So it means that countries shouldn't go at the same speed, but should go at, at, some, at speeds that do not create major imbalances. And that's called convergence. That's called convergence. Eh? And um, I think that, uh, to some extent, great progress has been achieved on, on that ground since, uh, since the Maastricht Treaty. One, uh, one interesting and certainly welcome data that we can extract from the variety of data that we have on this ongoing recovery is that the degree of divergence between different countries, and I'll say in a moment, actually, what do we mean by that? Well, we look at value added value-added growth, growth of value-added in different countries, and then we calculate a dispersion index of this growth in value-added. And nowadays, it's at historical minimum. It's actually the, the same dispersion we had in 1997. So it means that efforts towards converging is there. But there should also be convergence as far as policies are concerned. Namely, again, I go back to structural reforms are important, and what you want to see is the countries converging their policies, aligning their structural reforms to the best practices. That's very, very important for the resilience of the monetary union. It's one of the two pillars upon the monetary union is based, convergence. And the second one is trust. And what we are doing exactly at this point in time is try to strengthen convergence and repair and strengthen trust as well. 
So I think the keynote here is strengthening trust. And with that, I would like to thank you. Thank you. President. Thank you. I am now going to bring, why don't you sit down? Please. Over there. Fine. Where? Over there. Okay. Um, we've mentioned it's extremely important for us to have your views. Just by seeing all the questions that we're getting, it helps us. This is the beginning of more of a challenge that we want to have with you. That's why I wanted to make sure that you're aware of, a, of the next competition that we're going to do. We're going to work with the foundation of the University de Lyon for your Euro video challenge, because we know very much we're still in print, but you don't read that much. Maybe you're an exception. People watch videos, and that's what we need to work on as well. So we'll be focusing on this in the summer, inviting you to participate. And with that, I would close our part and hand over to Governor Carlos da Silva Costa, the governor of the Bank of Spain, uh, of Portugal, <laughs> the Portugal, and uh, invite you for your remarks. Thank you. President Draghi, Rector, Professor Ant Antonio Cruz Serra, let me make in a very short uh, closing four points and previously two introductory notes. The first one is to say that it's a great pleasure and satisfaction that Bank Portugal worked with ECB and the Lisbon School of Economics and Management to organize the first ECB Youth Dialogue in Lisbon. This seminar provides an important opportunity for economic students to put questions to the ECB president, Mr. Draghi, and uh, to get clarifications and issues that concern them. This, this initiative clearly demonstrates the ECB endeavor to be an open institution that is closely linked to the society, in particular, the European use. Let me add a second uh, note that is personal. For me, it's a pleasure to, to be at closing this uh, session because I was, a long time ago, during six years, vice chair of a, a European-wide think tank on the future of industry manufacturing in Europe. And uh, we were uh, discussing a lot about uh, innovation, about employment, and about youth. And to have the opportunity to close this session is also a way of going back 15 years in my own life. Turn turning now to the topic of this dialogue, youth, innovation, and productivity in Europe, I would like to start uh, uh, by pointing out that we live in a challenged world both in social and economic terms. But this should not be as a negative factor because if prepared for and overcome, challenge lead to progress. Let me conclude to say that, that is necessary to have in mind four ideas. Force, ideas, four ideas that are very important. First, innovation is a continuing process or even a state of mind, I prefer to say a state of mind, it should be not forgotten that sometimes innovation requires long-term research periods, and it's the answer to the medical research that we need to promote, reaching up to 10 or 15 years. Support for long-term research is necessary. It can be hardly be provided by firms, and it's now important to understand that it is a public good that needs to be provided by the European Union. Secondly, the pool of startups is important because it constitutes the cradle of successful firms of the future. Nevertheless, the early failure of most of these firms should not be taken as problematic. The high mortality rate of startups is, to a large extent, the result of a natural process of selection of good ideas and efficient firms 
by the market forces. The problem is to stay with them in Europe, and sometimes we lose them after being successful. Therefore, public bodies and public policies target at supporting startups that have not been prov proven able to compete in the markets are expensive and clearly not efficient. But we need to go ahead with the, the right institutional framework in order to select the right startups and the successful ones. Thirdly, and as a follow up to the previous point, the financing of radical innovation of startups is not the primary goal of the banking system, and we need a banking system for the firms that are already uh, doing well, but we need also financial instruments for uh, startups, and we miss them in Europe. The high levels of risk involved call for the intervention of specialized operators, for instance, venture capital or business angels. Unfortunately, in Portugal, and I will say in Europe, these operators are still not sufficiently developed, and the possibility of ventures with larger foreign part partners is limited. And I will uh, remember that we need to put also a lot of emphasis on that point when we speak about the uh, Juncker plan. If there is no radical innovation, there will be no future, and there will be no radical innovation without the right institutional setup. Finally, and fourthly, the challenge in Portugal is to speed up the pace of reform and further modernize its firms. Only high-performance firms can afford to pay the wage of those that make difference in terms of innovation and entrepreneurship. Although foreign experience by young people, high-skilled workers is beneficial, it should not be a way of promoting a brain drain. However, as the initial said, challenge should be seen as opportunities to improve, not as problems. And the, the most important problem is to create, or the most important challenge is to create the right institutional framework in fundamental research, in promoting the venture capital and the, the, venture and the speed the process of uh, startups that are successful, and after to ensure that these uh, startups have the right environment to grow and to be successful big companies in future. Thank you very much, President, to come to Portugal. Thank you very much for your uh, explanations. And uh, if, he, there, if there is something that comes from your intervention, is that the banking system is not far away of the real economy and the central bankers are not far away of the banking system and the real economy. Thank you very much.